you very much indeed. Well, I feel obviously at home uh, above the water, um, as we are at the moment. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd also like to start, I mean, this is a kind of, I'm, I'm going to talk about three or four things that I've been involved with. And I'm going to start with something which uh, I'm proud to be associated with. It's here, it's next week. It's a concert called The Basque Chambers by the composer Ian Chambers. And uh, in my professional life, uh, I often come across an awful lot of people who's, who, whose kind of gut reaction is no. The knee jerk is no. The G, the, you know, it's, it's kind of beyond my job description. But the guys at Tower Bridge have been very, very welcoming to us. And we, 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 we have an extraordinary concert in what's called the Bascule Chambers uh, on Friday, Saturday and Sunday next week. The Bascule Chambers is the void, if you can imagine it, when the bridge opens, the end of the road has got to go somewhere. That's called the Bascule Chamber. So when the road closes again, there's this lovely void. And uh, Ian Chambers, the composer, has written a piece for this space, uh, Tower Bridge, to their... I'm so delighted. They've, th they've given us opportunity to, to uh, invite an audience into this remarkable space. So uh, for a number of performances on Friday, it's all sold out. I'm terribly sorry if you haven't got tickets. If you've got tickets, it's brilliant. Look forward to it. If you haven't got tickets, look forward to it next year. But thank you very much to uh, Tower Bridge who've allowed us uh, to uh, have a little play in, in this remarkable uh, structure that we're in at the moment. Um, this is another very, very challenging piece uh, that we commissioned this year. So the, 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 the event I do is called Totally Thames now. It was called Thames Festival. Uh, totally Thames is a, is a season of river and river-related events uh, uh, throughout September from Hampton Court uh, in, in the west through to the Dartford Crossing in the east over the whole month of September. And it's on the wet bit, the river, it's on the slightly dry, slightly wet bit, which is the foreshore, and it's on the dry bit, which is the uh, riverside walkway and you know, venues associated up and down. Um, I've always wanted to do something which, was, uh, which reflected the tides. The river, of course, rises and falls by seven metres twice a day uh, in the centre of town. It's remarkable. London is remarkable for its river. It's so vibrant, it's, so, it's, it's been talked about as, a, as the mouth that we communicate with, but when it breathes in, it sucks in all this water that rises seven metres. When it breathes out again on the ebbing tide, it releases it, and as it releases it, some parts of the river are exposed as foreshore. Uh, and some of those bits are sandy, like the, by the National Theatre, uh, by, the, by Gabriel's Wharf. Other bits are slippery and uncertain, but I've always thought how brilliant it would be to commission an artist to create for that space a sculptures which were designed to be concealed and revealed by the tides. So what did, I went online, I thought, you know, who am I going to get? Underwater sculptures. And there's only one guy that pops up when you Google underwater sculpture, and it's Jason de Cairo's Taylor. Um, he's a British born and uh, was trained uh, in London, uh, and then, I don't know, he got a passion for diving. So he kind of shelved his art life and became a diver. And, and, and for 20 years, he became a naturalist and, and, uh, and a diver, and, and was aware of the depredation of the coral reefs, um, and uh, thought, you know, what, am I, what can I do about this? And was aware that as a diver, he himself was, uh, was causing a lot of the harm uh, to the coral reefs themselves. So he went back to his life as, a, as an artist and decided to create art underwater as a kind of diversionary tactic. So he thought, actually, if the divers would go and see the art rather than the coral reefs, at least that would save the coral reefs. So he created these um, underwater um, sculptures in this pH neutral material, which after three years will attract coral uh, uh, growth itself. Uh, it's created these remarkable environments. Uh, there's one off the coast of Grenada in the West Indies, there's a second uh, off the coast of Cancun in Mexico, which has 500 of his pieces. Um, uh, and he's now working on a third, uh, these huge installations uh, uh, underwater um, in the Canary Islands, and he's off to Bali next. So what could, what could entice this guy to come to London and the, worky, and the murky waters of the Thames to, to, to uh, create his first piece? Well, um, fortunately, I, I think in this play, um, his mum was, uh, was an instrumental character because uh, his mother has a, has a fear of flying and uh, hasn't been to see any of his works overseas. <laughs> and I suspect as well his mother wasn't so um, happy with the idea about snuggling into a, into a wetsuit and, and, and the uh, sub-aqua gear to, to go down the sea. But nevertheless, his mother features quite highly in this. And uh, Jason thought, well, actually, all right, um, you know, we'll focus on this and, we'll, we'll, and create a new piece for the foreshore in London. Now, this, to my knowledge, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first piece of public art uh, on the Thames foreshore uh, in central London. 
There's one piece which is further downriver um, by the Dartford crossing, but this is the first piece which is, uh, which is intended to be concealed and revealed by the tide. It's on the foreshore uh, in Vauxhall, just by the MI6 building, the one that was blown up for the James Bond uh, film Skyfall, and it's, uh, it's only available until the end of uh, September. And the foreshore is this remarkable kind of no man's land, really, because it was never, it's for, for uh, actually until, until 2012, no one would own up to owning it. No one would say, listen, it's either it's Lambeth's or it's Southwark's or it's, Lam or it's Westminster's or wherever it might be, or it's the Port of London Authority. Everyone kind of slightly refused ownership of it. Um, it was a no man's land. And we, we worked with a group called um, Reclaim the Beach um, who played on this idea of, 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 uh, of this was a kind of loophole in licensable land. And they created parties on the foreshore. Um, up by the, the ones that we um, helped promote were up by... Um, at the National Theatre, and they would, as the tide went out, they would put a, they would kind of all roll out, and they put a stage up and a sound system, and the bands would come on out, and they would play, and people would have this amazing beach party on the foreshore until the, the tide turned and the water would come in again, and they would, they would remove everything um, off the foreshore and as the waters came in again, and they were a leave-no-trace outfit, so for them, they, they took pride in taking everything off, but that's just, that's just this whole thing about this, the, 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 the foreshore, unusual, liminal place which no one would, gain, would, would admit authority to until recently when 20, in 2012 the Port of London Authority now has negotiated ownership for uh, this land. So this was even tougher for us and still is in fact because the Port of London Authority owns 95% or plus of the land. The remaining bit is still owned by the Crown Estates. And this particular bit, the access, is owned by someone else. And we, know, this is terrible business where we actually have to put notices up to advise people of the risks of going onto the foreshore. Um, you know, it's slippery, it's, you know, there's a puddle that you might sink into and all that other stuff that, uh, I mean, it's the foreshore, you know, it's, you know, do you need that, do you need that notice when you go on the beach, you know? <laughs> We need it here. This is another one that took a, a bit of time to do and, 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 and risk associated. This was, a, this was the launch of the Thames Festival in 1997. And this was, a, this was the ambition for the Thames Festival to be this kind of you know, great um, uh, uh, commissioner of new work. The wire walk actually didn't just have one wire walker, it had two. They, they, one started from the north to walk south and the other simultaneously from the south to walk north. And it was this, 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 you know, we're talking 450 metres of wire, no thicker than my thumb, at 50 metres high above the water level. Um, and, the, of course, the question on everyone's minds is, OK, you've got one from the north, one from the south, they're both walking along the same wire. What the hell's going to happen in the middle? What's going to happen? They can hardly kind of shimmy beside each other, can they? And uh, there was also this issue about, are they going to die? You know, are they really? There's no... <laughs> Nothing's holding them up. And actually, this guy's Didier. He's a Frenchman. And uh, his, his wife uh, was expecting their first child, um, very, very heavily pregnant, and was hysterical, literally. was absolutely hysterical before um, he set off, saying, he's going to die. He's, he's gonna, he, he, it was really the worst thing that you can ever imagine to give someone the karma, you know, to do what, what, what he did. And the, um, the walk relies, in order, the, a wire walk at high level re requires something called cavalities, which stop the wire swinging laterally. And you need people to hold these things. And we got all these local beefy guys to hold these things. And as soon as the wife started going hysterical, the guy said, listen, I can't, I can't do this. I can't take the responsibility. I'm off. So suddenly we had an even greater chance that Didier, and on the other side, Jade was going to die as these swinging wires were going to go through. Anyway, the long and the short of it is they did complete it. It was a remarkable, it was a remarkable sunset, low tide, thousands and thousands of people. Jade, in fact, the, the guy from the north walking south, lay down on his back and allowed Didier to walk over his chest to reach the other side. Amazing thing. Anyway, that's that one. That launched, and we launched successfully um, to make uh, um, the Thames Festival uh, what it is. This um, was the uh, Queen's Diamond Jubilee, another very, very unusual event on the river. In fact, an event of this scale had not happened on the river for over 400 years. And even then, I suspect it was journalistic license to say that they did it more than, that, more than now. This was a 1,000 vessels uh, on the river. 
uh, it, you know, the river has never, ever, I th in, in my view, ever sustained uh, a, a, an event of this size. Um, and it was, a, it was a kind of remarkable achievement in that it went from nothing, n you know, no precedent, you know, to doing the biggest ever event on the river. And only really possible because everyone on the river um, brought their collective knowledge uh, together and allowed that collective knowledge to be shared. And that collective knowledge was trusted by the authorities concerned. And I think it's a really remarkable uh, uh, example of a community um, empowering itself um, through uh, the, the, the trust that it, it gave um, to those that required um, uh, its endorsement um, of just saying, listen, just trust us. We'll do that and we'll do it well. And when you're saying trust us with the passengers that were obviously afloat on that day um, and the the way that London had to grind to a halt. I mean, every bridge was closed to traffic. You know, you, you think about that for a second and think about what that means to the emergency services if something goes wrong. Think about what it means to, you know, just grinding around London. It was, it was, it was the most remarkable experience of a city, I think, believing in itself that it could do something remarkable um, and, and achieving it. Now, all right, I didn't appreciate that it was going to rain in the way that it did <laughs> on that day. In my mind's eye, it was a beautiful day. For the, it took three and a half years to, to, to bring this to fruition. But I never know. I, mean, I thought, of course, you think about rain and the, you know, there were bits and pieces that were there to, to, to accommodate the rain. It was the chill factor which really was very, very... Um, that was unusual and we, 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 we were taken aback at that. And it nearly did for one of the senior members of the royal family, of course, uh, which would have been the legacy that I would have hated for the event. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, he, he survived. But actually, the, um, you know, when people ask me, you know, do, I, do I kind of regret the weather? Do I regret? Actually, no, because I think it became something that was, um, it became quintessentially British through the weather. <laughs> You know, when I talk about it, and I talk about it particularly overseas, they say, you know, it could only happen. It could only happen here. You could only ever do something like that. And I, I, I believe that that's now part of its character. It's part of its, um, part of its track record, if you like. Now, this is something which I'm working on next. It's, um, it's, the, it's about the houseboat communities up and down the river. There are some... Um, there are... I mean, I find it extraordinary that, that there are many, many histories of the river... Um, and there is, n there is never, I would say never, or if ever, very, very scant reference to those that live on the river, the houseboat communities. Now, there are some 3,000 people who live on boats on the, in, the, in, in the capital city. Most of those boats uh, are in the um, docks and the, and the um, uh, canal systems. Um, on, the, on the tidal Thames, which is the bit that, as you know now, goes up and down, there are some 400 boats, and they're in 35 communities up and down the river. And these, for me, are, are floating villages. They are, you know, they have their own kind of sense of identity, their, their, their own um, sense of, uh, of, um, of, of life and, and, and through history. And there's, there is very, very little history. There's nothing, you know, go online, you try and find something. There's very, very little of it. And um, uh, I think there is an extraordinary story to be told out of the people who struggle to live by the river, um, and are now those communities are now being uh, 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 are now being affected by the rising uh, house prices around them. So most people choose to go on the river originally because of low price. It's a cheap option in London, <coughs> and it's and it's a way for, for a lot of people to, to live closer to nature. You know, they, 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 the views out of these boats. This is actually just by just below us here, just by Tower Bridge. If you look down, this is called Downing's Road uh, uh, moorings, and on the north side. You'll see community, uh, you'll see um, Hermitage community moorings on the, on the north side too. And, and most of these guys choose to live by the river initially because it's cheap. It's a great place to live in the centre of, in the, center of, the of, uh, of the capital and it's cheap. But also because they've, it's an alternative lifestyle choice. Now, these boats are changing hands for more than a million pounds. You know, so you've got newer people who are coming in that can't afford to live on these boats anymore, or there is a kind of internal tussle, if you like, between those that have been there for many years and new people who are expecting a lifestyle. When you buy something for a million, Christ, you know, come on, where's the facilities? You know, so you, you've got an intern, there's such internal disruption be behind these liminal communities, these water gypsies, if you like, 
that, 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 uh, that, that are being radically affected by uh, the changes in property prices here. And I'll leave you on a thought that, 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 that is about this, uh, this, this kind of, those that, those that kind of have a, that, that, that want to live their lives, that want to live their lives differently in our capital city, uh, I think we have to respect their, their um, choice of life, their choice of existence in ways which uh, maybe are mitigate against the property price uh, um, uh, way in which the, uh, these, um, uh, that's so radically affecting not only these communities, but I suspect many, many as well. Young people, this used to be the young person's choice to live in London. I mean, who can afford a, 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 an immediate price of £850,000 where you don't have the option of a mortgage? On these, you, you can't get a mortgage on, on, on most of these uh, properties. So we're, we're, we're kind of changing the, the, the way in which the river lives as much as we're changing the way uh, in which the places around it survive. Am I all right? <laughs>